Hey everybody, Tom Barnes, stories from the 70A, and this could go all over the world, not just here in Chicago or in Vegas, where my friend Scott is uh, out there enjoying the probably warmer weather than we have here in Chicago. How are you doing, Scott? It, I'm doing great, Tom, and it's, it's good to be here, and it's a little little blustery here in Las Vegas today. Oh, well, blustery, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Groundhog's Day to you. We're recording this on Groundhog Day. It'll be airing afterwards, but... Uh, Scott Bond, you are a, a criminologist. You started off in TV, though. I noticed that I was looking at your career. You were like, uh, you had some fancy pants uh, title in uh, the TV world before you kind of dipped into the world of the criminal. And you wrote a couple books, including uh, Why We Love Serial Killers, that you've now turned into this one man theatrical show that will be here in Chicago at City Winery in April. That's correct. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I, I am a criminologist. I study the criminal mind. I've sat down with some of the most notorious serial killers of all time. But for the first 20 years of my career, I was in the media and advertising world and I was a, a vice president at NBC. And it was there that I that I really came to see that the news and entertainment media almost commodify some of these individuals and turn them into what I call celebrity monsters. You know, and I'm talking about the Ted Bundys and the Charles Mansons and the John Wayne Gacy's, you know, for example, you know, with a tip of the hat there to Chicago or H.H. Yeah. Holmes, another infamous Chicago serial killer. Like the original. <laughs> That's some right. Some would argue. That's right. That's right. And so, um, you know, it was that sort of that dual approach of the coming at it from the media, coming at it from uh, as a criminologist that I realized, man, there's just such a fascination with these individuals. Yeah. And that's what you dive into uh, in, with your book and like the why we love serial killers and the interest. I think the fascinating uh, stat is women are hardcore followers of this genre, if you will. You know, I mean, somewhere about 80% of the fan base is women. And, but I know a lot of dudes that love it too, but it's like women seem to really fall, you know, follow this. Why is that, do you think? Well, it, it's absolutely true. I mean, it's something as a, um, you know, the, the fact that I've been in true crime and television for a while, I've always known that the true crime audience is about 80 to 90% women. But it wasn't until I took my show out on the road uh, starting last uh, May that I really saw wherever I go around the country, the audience is 80 to 90 percent women. Sometimes it's mothers and daughters. Sometimes it's girls night out, you know, a Thursday night like this at the city winery and the girls are out together and they it's it's almost like a sisterhood and they're there to express their collective uh, fascination and fear somewhat of these individuals. And what I find that many of these women are looking for is um, how to detect the sociopath. No one wants to be the victim of the next Ted Bundy or John Wayne Gacy, but no one wants to marry or get involved with, you know, or date the, the, the next Ted Bundy. So I have many right. women saying to me, what should I look for? What are those characteristics? What stands out as someone who might be a real, you know, a real problem? Yeah, and it's interesting that you say that because if anybody's watched any documentaries or followed your work and with streaming, the, the true crime you know, genre has exploded, I feel, you know, everywhere where, uh, you know, we see like Mindhunters on Netflix where it talks about kind of the beginning of the FBI profiling serial killers, you know, That's but, right. uh, and what would you say, like for women, because in those you see John Wayne Gacy was married, I think, was he married more than once? Yes, yes. Right. And many of them are family men, you know, right. In including the Long Island serial killer. And I was involved in that case in, in New York. Um, right, another, just a recent one. That's right, that's right. So yes, and, and that makes it equally frightening. I think you know the, 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 the most frightening monster of all is the monster who's invisible and lives next door. And in many ways, that's what John Wayne Gacy and Ted Bundy and Dennis Rader, BTK, Bind, Torture, yeah. Kill who I was very uh, extensively corresponding with uh, for my book, um, these individuals are invisible in plain sight. They, they're family men. They have normal jobs. They, in many times, in many cases, they're even pillars of their community. Like, like John Wayne Gacy was, uh, yeah. you know, was a, was a um, JC man of the year. 
Uh, Dennis Rader was the Boy Scout leader and the uh, president of his Lutheran Church Association. You know, talk talk about a talk about an irony and a and a, a hypocrisy there. You know, president of the church and bloodthirsty serial killer. You know, but the reason that these individuals are able to pull this off is the majority of them are psychopaths. And what that is, is it's not a mental illness. It's not, you know, like people say to me, you know, these guys must be batshit crazy. Well, to the layman, yes, doing the things that they do, but clinically they're really not. It's a it's an antisocial personality disorder, uh, psychopathy. And they're born literally with a chip in their brain, if you will, that's a little bit different. They respond to stimuli differently. They respond to um, uh, uh, emotions differently. And they really just can't connect with other people, which is why they're able to objectify and kill with such impunity and no remorse, pity, shame, guilt, or even fear. You know, in many ways, they're, they're like a great white shark. They're just a killing machine. So, for you know, I imagine, and I've had this debate with many people, just, you know, when you watch these documentaries, you talk about these things, are there, would you say that, are there serial killer, or a mind of a serial killer, when you talk about that, that chip, that don't kill and go on living normal lives, or is that chip like a dead ringer, they're going to turn into this, or do no, some just no. have better ways of controlling it? It's a wonderful question, and I, I have a, a colleague over in England named Kevin Dutton, and he studies very high functioning and successful psychopaths. And, um, and, and so if you think about it, what are the hallmarks of being a psychopath? They are the, the disdain for rules, the disdain for laws and, 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 and the uh, feelings and needs of others. It's an individual who is very driven and goal oriented, but they don't care if they hurt people along the way. Well, sadly, if you think about that, those very same characteristics that might drive one to kill could also drive one to be very successful in business or politics or, or various other venues. And sports, it's, <laughs> it's not surprising. And, you know, people might chuckle. And, and if you think about it, but it makes a lot of sense. There are, there are a lot of very high functioning psychopaths in business and politics and other, um, uh, and also very, very um, stressful endeavors. Uh, things like neuroscience and neurosurgery, you will find psychopaths because it requires the ability to focus like a laser and just block everything out. Um, and which is why psychopath uh, psychopathic serial killers often get away with their murders for long periods of time, not because they're so much more intelligent than anyone else. It's just that they are meticulous and so focused and organized that they don't leave a lot of evidence. They don't leave a lot of trails and, and uh, clues for authorities to follow up on, which is why some of them get away with this for well, BTK, Dennis Rader, was uh, loose for 30 years. It took him 30 years before they finally got him. So do you think then with these serial killers that do get caught or almost taunt the media, like back in, let's say, the, the golden age, back in the 70s, where in the 80s, where a lot of that stuff uh, was taunting the media, you know, the uh, Zodiac killer and all that stuff. Do you think it's a point to them where... It, it, their ego is so big and that laser focus, they think they're so smart that they won't get caught. They do taunt the police and use the media for how they used it back then or even using it now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not all serial killers crave notoriety and, and attention, but the ones that we're most familiar with uh, tend to be the ones who, uh, who did. And uh, it, for example, um, BTK, uh, Dennis Rader, corresponded extensively with the media playing Catch Me uh, If You Can. And he truly thought he was the smartest guy in town and that they would never find him. And he loved planting little clues and, and, and creating misdirection. Um, for him, the thrill, part of the thrill was playing that game. Um, same thing with Son of Sam, you know, wrote letters um, to, to authorities. Uh, you mentioned um, the Zodiac. So yes, many of the ones that I would say are sort of the OG uh, 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 original gangster serial killers, if there was a Mount <laughs> Rushmore of serial killers, these guys would probably be on it. And they are the ones who truly crave that, that attention. And again, it's because they're narcissists. 
They're psychopaths in that they're disconnected. They commodify, objectify humans. They don't, they, they, they don't, killing means nothing to them. And they actually find it satisfying. But then they're also narcissists, meaning that everything is about them. It's, it's, it, they only see the world from their perspective. And a guy like, um, uh, I believe, Rex Hewerman, who's been charged with the Long Island serial killer um, uh, murders, and certainly BTK, Dennis Rader, are what are known as malignant narcissists. There's different kinds of narcissists. And a malignant, malignant narcissist is the most disturbing and, and deadly because it combines narcissism, this complete disdain for, for the needs of others. And I only see the world through my lens, but it combines it with the need to torture um, and sadism. So you put that together along with psychopathy and man, you got a deadly mix there for uh, to create a killing machine. I mean, there's so many questions. <laughs> like, it's, so, it's such a fascinating topic. With this, you know, you've meant you've sat down across, you know, the glass, if you will, from was it BTK and and other serial killers? Well, so I spent a day with uh, with the son of Sam, uh, David Berkowitz. BTK, I corresponded with extensively. You can't. He's actually locked up in solitary. You can't sit down with him per se. Um, but I, I mean, I literally uh, had lunch and you know broke bread with uh, with uh, the son of Sam. So when you talk to these folks, like obviously they're caught, and some of them will still go to the grave saying they never did it. They value you got the wrong guy. Is that just their the their ego just not refusing to admit defeat? And do they just get cocky by getting caught? Well, or this, lazy? This is really a wonderful question. And um, and it's you have to start with the understanding that these individuals, because they're psychopaths and narcissists, all they care about is what will satisfy their own ego and essentially amuse them. OK, so what often happens and this happened with Ted Bundy, um, it happened with um, BTK um, and, and I think it, it quite possibly will happen with Rex Hewerman is for a while they will maintain their innocence and um, and defy authorities until they reach a point where they see that um, uh, the, the, the gig is up, so to speak. They've got the evidence, they, the, the, the of law enforcement knows it's them. And then oftentimes what will happen is they'll flip the script and they will begin to try to milk the story and um, they will they will say, well, there might be other bodies out there, you know, maybe maybe this isn't over with. And they will try to create a whole new narrative with themselves at the center of it where they can uh, still maintain um, their presence on stage. And that, you know, for example, Bundy did that and, and um, to a certain extent, BTK. And I think Rex Hewerman, um, the Long Island serial killer, will likely do that. And um, and eventually, eventually what happens, um, and in the case of BTK, is he said, you know what, you got me, but let me tell you what I did. Let me tell you what a genius I am. It took you 30 years because I'm smarter than you. And so it allowed him to go back on stage again and talk about his body of work and how brilliant he is. Always painting themselves as the hero in their story. And exactly, they have to be at the center of it, and that's the that's the narcissism. Um, and um, and and they, they typically, these true true psychopaths don't even acknowledge the concept of victim. Um, Ted Bundy referred to his victims as objects. I mean, he truly objectified them and saw them as just um, objects for his amusement. And in the case of BTK, he called them projects as if he was describing his hobby of putting together model airplanes or something like that. And he would truly, he would truly describe a killing, a murder, as if he was saying, um, here's how you put uh, the recipe for a cake. You add a teaspoon of this and two teaspoons of that no emotion whatsoever. Man, oh man, it's just, it's an incredible thing to think about, you know, the mass quantity of serial killers that the world has known that we know of. There's probably so many that we don't know because they're, 
even a higher functioning version of like a Ted Bundy and, you know, eventually, but is there, have you, in your experience, have you seen a consistent, like, uh, are most of these serial killers that we know of as the public, were they abused as kids were, you know, on one way or another, is that like the common theme? Is that like the thing with that little chip that you said in their brain that just puts them into that direction from not businessman tycoon to serial killer? Cause they were abused horribly as children. Well, you know, that gets to the whole nature versus nurture debate. You know, nature, were they born that way? Nurture, were they environmentally um, conditioned through abuse and et cetera? And like most things in life, it's it's not black and white. I mean, it's a combination. Um, I You can point to individuals who certainly suffered tremendous trauma and abuse, like Ed Kemper, who was um, in the, uh, you know, very much um, depicted in the Mindhunter series yeah. that you were about on Netflix, he was, his mother would just tortured him and tormented him, burned him with cigarettes. I mean, did, you know, terrible things to him. But then you have other individuals like Dennis Rader um, and even, even Berkowitz and, um, uh, and, and Jeffrey Dahmer who had relatively normal childhoods. Um, you know, yeah, he lived with his grandma for a lot of, when he was doing all that stuff. Exactly, exactly. But what happens with many of these individuals, and it's definitely true of Dahmer, um, uh, BTK and Bundy, is right around puberty, right, right around the, you know, that coming of age, something happens where sexuality and sexual pleasure in their mind becomes intertwined and twisted with causing harm and torture and agony. And sometimes it starts with um, uh, hurting animals and they become sexually aroused by hurting animals. Um, BTK told me the story, Raider told me this story directly. The first time he had this sensation, he was 10 years old, he was at his mother's, or excuse me, his grandmother's farm, and she killed a chicken for dinner, chopped his head off. And he said when he saw that blood squirt across the backyard, he became sexually aroused. And he didn't even know what it was. He was 10 years old. He just knew he liked the feeling. And over time, he fed this fantasy, and he began to fantasize about bondage and, and, and torturing women and, and, and raping and killing. And it, it, it just escalated, escalated, escalated until he was in his 20s. And it reached what I like to call a tipping point where he could no longer live in his fantasies anymore. And he had to actualize it. He had to really go out and kill. And that is, um, of course, um, when the, 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 that's the point of no return. That's when the train leaves the station. There's no turning back. Yeah. And I imagine, you know, now here we are in 2024, you know, if kids are born with these, you know, this version of a brain, you would think that society could better understand it sooner and quicker if they do see, God forbid, a child that is, you know, all of a sudden you come home and the cat's dead and the kid's eight years old and he's hiding the night, you know, like something like that, where perhaps maybe they could intervene and get that kid back on the right path. But I imagine they're still going to miss some like serial killers aren't going to go away. It might be different in the way it's portrayed in the media because the media has learned what to do and not to do with these. But I, it seems like this is something that's never going to go away. Absolutely. I, I mean, this, 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 unfortunately, this um, uh, condition and, you know, what we, we don't understand why some of them, uh, some psychopaths become, can, uh, have this connection with sex and torture and torment and killing that, that seems to happen around puberty. We don't know why that happens, uh, but we simply, you know, we, we know retrospectively that it does happen. And certainly there are things you can look out for, uh, red flags that parents can look out for, including things like harming animals, um, even seemingly benign things. Like if your child just doesn't react normally to things that you would think would normally make a child cry or even make a child laugh, if they just don't have that range of emotions, and if they see indifference to um, the suffering of animals and other people, those are certainly red, you know, red flags. Um, but you're right; it's 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 not that I, you know uh, this is not going to just leave um, uh, uh, society, unfortunately. Um, but we are getting much much 
better at apprehending these individuals, identifying them, profiling them, and capturing them much earlier than before. And that's you know due to our friends um, in the FBI, um, in, in Quantico, the, uh, the, the profilers uh, like John Douglas and Ray, Roy Hazelwood, uh, a late uh, a friend of mine, and others, and DNA, you know, DNA has gone yeah, a long it's a big one. way to solving cold cases. The um, the, the uh, Golden State Killer out in California, they got him through literally ancestry, familial DNA, BTK, they got him through DNA. So these are, you know, solving cases. And um, I have a theory about why there are far fewer serial killers now than there were in the 1970s and 1980s. And it's partially due to all the things that we've talked about, the better technology and policing techniques. But also, it's due to the fact that I think we're apprehending them earlier than before. And um, uh, your audience may be familiar with the Brian Koberger case. Brian uh, Koberger has been charged with four uh, murders Ida and students in, in Idaho. And right. I have looked at his tra trajectory toward becoming a murderer, assuming that he is found guilty. And I see tremendous parallels between he and some other serial killers. And I think if he had not been apprehended when he was, there's an excellent chance that he would have gone on to become a serial killer. You know, it's funny, you, you talk to people in the neighborhood. I live in the city where, you know, you know, like your block but you're in a block among thousands of blocks, you know, where you ride your bike, you always go past that one house where you see that one strange person outside. You're like, eh, something's off about them. It makes you wonder, you know, like there could be like hiding in plain sight, you know, where you just have to be smarter than what we were 30 years ago. I'm not saying everybody's a killer that's weird or strange or how you perceive it to be weird or strange. But if somebody, I've heard this time and time again in my life, Somebody shows you who they are, believe them. That's true. That's absolutely true. But you know, let's you know, let's make let's make um, you know your uh, the, the, the folks in Chicago and your audience uh, feel a little bit better. Um, I I make an analogy that a serial killer like Jeffrey Dahmer has three things in common with another predator in nature, and that is a great white shark. And the three things that they have in common are they are both rare, exotic, and deadly. And in the case of Dahmer specifically as a serial killer, he also ate people like, like sharks. But yeah. the reason it's such a good analogy, this comparison is I've done the, statist the statistics here, the numbers, and the likelihood of being killed by either a serial killer or a great white shark are about the same. And that is 150 million to one. So wow. the odds are not that great, even though they get all the attention that they get, you know, in the media and, and news and entertainment, the odds are very small. And if you really want to sleep well tonight, here's another statistic. You're twice as likely to be killed by a soft drink vending machine falling on top of you and crushing you than you are to be killed by a serial killer. So. Right. I didn't I don't want to insinuate that, uh, you know, Martha down the street and Bob are, you know, cannibals and serial killers. That's not what I meant. But I get the analogy and I appreciate the analogy because that is also the media sensationalizing things sometimes. And mm -hmm. I don't want to be part of that. But it's just interesting. All this information that we had that the FBI and the police did not have prior to like the 70s. And, you know, before I let you get out of here and thank you for taking time, I wanted to ask you about H.H. Holmes, just because you will be in Chicago here at City Winery on the 11th. And, you know, H.H. Oh, Holmes, 11th. Uh, I'm sorry, April, I said it's February now, April. Um, and that, you know, a lot of people have read Devil in the White City, and that's kind of where they were introduced to the to the person, H.H. H. Holmes, who is a real person. Um, and what are your thoughts on people saying that perhaps maybe that was the first serial killer? Because I think that could be, that's crazy. I mean, humans have been on this planet for thousands of years. That couldn't be the first one. It's just the first one that we documented or what do you think? Yeah, yeah, no. Um, I mean, sir, there, there have been serial killers uh, documented in, in uh, different uh, narratives in, in, in every country um, back to recorded history. I would say H.H. H. Holmes was simply, um, he, he is our 
uh, Jack the Ripper, because they they occurred roughly the same time in the late 19th century. And Jack, uh, Jack the Ripper became all the rage over there. And H.H. H. Holmes was our first um, uh, poster boy serial killer, if you will. Um, and, and of course, the case is so incredible, it's so fascinating um, that, that it stands the test of time, because here you had a guy who was actually had, had a, uh, he was a doctor, you know, and he was a business. Yeah. He was highly, highly accomplished. And he had that hotel, the castle there in, you know, in downtown Chicago. And it, it essentially had a torture chamber down in the basement and women would go in there. He would rob them. He would uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, get their insurance money, their inheritance. They disappear into the basement where he had a blast furnace and they would never be heard from again. You know, and he did this over and over and over. So it's just such an incredible, compelling story um, that I would just say he was the, um, you know, he he was he's the, was the launching pad, but uh, for notoriety and publicity of serial killers in this country. But he was certainly not the first, and unfortunately, he certainly won't be the last. But uh, and uh, and that's why your your series and that you go around your your show is such a it's a great avenue for people who want to be curious and who want to be educated properly because there's so much bad things out there to hear from an expert like yourself where people can sit down and it was so popular your first edition of this in the spring of last year that you're allowing a little bit more q a time this go around right absolutely um you know the the, uh, the show is the same as the name of my book which is why we love serial killers which i know is an ironic title but uh people are fascinated with these things and the first my show is in two acts Act number one, I really try to, to um, take people inside of the minds of some of the most notorious serial killers of all time, a number of whom I've actually, uh, you know, either corresponded with or sat down with directly, like Son of Sam and BTK and the Long Island serial killer, um, going into their deepest, darkest fantasies and secrets. And then in the second half of the um, show or act number two, what I do is I try to answer many of the questions about serial killers and why they do what they do and, and, and even explore our own fascination with them, um, turn the mirror around and you know, look at our own fascination. And then I do about a 30 minute Q&A. And what I found is that Q&A session, it just brings people alive because so many people have questions, burning questions that they've always wanted to ask about serial killers, but they didn't have the, the forum, you know, the place to do it. Well, I'm there. I'm, I'm coming to Chicago to answer your questions. So I'm really looking forward to it on April 11th. Yes. And you are gracious enough to give me a couple of passes to hand out to anybody that's watching that all they have to do is go to uh, my website if you're watching this on YouTube. And I'll even put a little link on my webpage, though, where people can get at it. But explain what the event. I know you just talked a little bit about the back half of it the, in the, or the both halves of it. But it's a very, uh, you know, city winery is an intimate space. It's not a giant, huge auditorium where people can hear each other, ask these questions and you answering them and feel probably safe, you know. Yeah, absolutely. It, you know, City Winery is a, it's just a, a beautiful venue, seats about 400 people. And of course, they have great food and of course, wine, because it's the, it's the City Winery. And it's going to be op an opportunity to, you know, come out on a Thursday evening and, um, you know, just uh, enjoy yourself. And, uh, and if you have an interest in true crime, which certainly millions and millions of people do, and I know lots of folks there in Chicago do, come out and um, learn some things that uh, may shock you and surprise you, but also some incredible anecdotes and stories that are gonna just blow people's minds. And some of which are, are actually quite humorous because these individuals are so over the top and, and so uh, outrageous that some of the things that they do are just, you know, uh, incredible. And, and, and in some, some cases, even, you know, like I said, uh, funny. So I, uh, I like to pe take people inside the minds of these individuals and, and show, show them how they think and what motivates them. Um, and um, uh, so uh, my, in my experience, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an educational evening, but it's also a very fun and entertaining evening, which um, you know, I, I uh, uh, enjoy as well. 
how many did you would you say you've interviewed as far as the serial killer you know status if you will how many of well, I've, I've corresponded I, i've corresponded with uh, uh probably half a dozen um uh, uh some of them extensively some some of them not so much um uh the the one that that i spent the most time with and actually spent an entire day in a maximum security prison was with david berkowitz and that's just um uh, well that's a big part of my show i talk about this experience and um i mean there there were things that happened there uh um uh it, events and, and anecdotes that uh, have never been heard before, you know, so because these are all based upon my own personal experiences. So you're not going to find them in other books or, or sure. uh, venues. So, um, uh, you know, it's unique and, and um, you know, and, it, and it's what, what I find is, and, and part of the psychology, I think, to why people are, are so fascinated by this stuff is when you take a Jeffrey Dahmer or a BTK um, or, a, or, or a, a Bundy, the things that they do to other living human beings are just so outrageous and, and so um, incomprehensible that it's truly terrifying. You know, it's truly terrifying. Yeah. And um, which is why we oftentimes just say, well, he's just a pure monster. He's just pure, pure evil. Well, the reality is He's still a human being and he functioned pretty well um, in the outside world, you know, aside from the killing. And so I think subconsciously, even we think if I can just understand them, if I can just wrap my mind around this a little bit, then maybe it's not so terrifying after all. So that's what I try to do is take people literally inside the minds to understand what drives these people. And, and, and as I said, you know, early on in our conversation, particularly to help women to see things to look for, uh, personality um, issues and, and red flags that they might identify in someone who maybe has uh, not their best interests at heart. What's the one last question, I promise. Uh, what's the one you walked away from where you were like, wow, that was terrifying. Just being in the, per talking to them on the phone, being with them in person, or just what they told you or a trans whatever it is that you were like, Oh yeah, that one. That's the most unique one. I terrifying that I. I had some, it makes me hard to sleep at. Yeah, yeah. I I would have to say BTK Dennis, Dennis Rader because um, and these these are his exact words he, that he gave to me. Um, I said to him, "What is it that drives you? You know, what 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 is the satisfaction that you gain from killing?" And he was a strangler, and he told me he said. When I put my hands around their neck, and it was usually uh, women, and I strangle the life of them, uh, the, the life out of them, and I see the 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 light of life die in their eyes, and I see their their they they die their eyes dying, he says, at that moment I know I am God. He's not saying I'm playing God. He's not saying I want to be God. At that moment I know I am God, and that's pretty yeah. scary. That is pretty scary. Uh, Scott, thank you so much for taking time to chat with me. And I really look forward to your event here in Chicago in April. It's going to be an incredible experience just to see you and meet you in person, but just to just get the whole show, if you will. So thank Absolutely. you very much. And people buying tickets, where do you want them to go? Um, citywinery.com slash events. Uh, or excuse me, City Winery dot com slash chicago slash events got it and then if people can purchase your book you have your own website any of that fun stuff yeah absolutely absolutely uh i got my book right here if why we love serial killers which is the same as the title of my show and you can go to my website which is docbon.com d-o-c-b-o-n-n.com and um, there are links for my book and it'll also link you to the city winery to buy uh, tickets so you can go to docbon.com as well well fantastic thank you so much for taking time to chat with me i really appreciate it have yourself a fantastic weekend and thank you and it was my pleasure <laughs>